We're very happy to be here in the office of Steve Allen in Van Nuys, California. What remains undone, Steve? My life, <laughs> for one thing. And at the age of 76, we don't know how much of that, an act three of some kind is down the line. But in terms of unrealized ambitions, uh, there are none. They've all been realized, and then some. That doesn't make you feel a little jaded or anything, you know, have that same zing? No, I feel sleepy, but then I always have. I'm a natural-born sleeper. As a matter of fact... Uh, oh, good morning. How is the Steve Allen of 76 different from the Steve Allen of 46? Uh, oddly enough, better in some ways, and I would not have anticipated that. I thought everything was going down on the charts for everybody who was ever alive, but I was mistaken, happily. I recall reading a marvelous review in Time uh, several months ago about a classical pianist named Earl, and his last name suddenly slips my mind because I never heard it before that point anyway, but he's one of the world's leading masters of the piano. And I've never read a more complimentary review than the time critic gave the gentleman. And uh, the relevance of all that to what we're talking about here is he was 80 years old. So uh, I, I don't run the 100-meter dash, obviously, at 76 as I did at 26. But uh, I'm better at playing jazz piano, which is one of my uh, means of making a living, now than I was even 10 or 15 years ago. My facility is greater, and I learn more and so forth. And I know, in fact, of a good many uh, pianists in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who don't seem to have lost anything physically. Uh, I'm also faster on the ad lib uh, trigger than I used to be. I, I don't have a standard act. I guess I'm the only comedian who, who would say that. Perhaps I should have a standard act, but I never have. I go on the stage for however long they want me. Usually it's an hour. And I do things, and the people laugh, and I take the money and go home. But that requires, of course, the gift of wit or, and the ability to exercise it. And uh, again, in response to your question, I'm uh, quicker at that now than I was uh, any earlier time. Well, not to be trite, but then... Oh, let's be trite. Do, <laughs> to what do you attribute it? I mean, do you have any kind of special uh, pill you take, a, a vitamin, a, uh, a health regimen, a diet? Well, I, as a matter of fact, I, I, I do uh, depend heavily on vitamin C, but of course you could give uh, 10,000 people an equal amount of vitamin C and none of them could ad-lib joke, so that's not that's the true. explanation for creativity. But it is uh, a means of helping the brain cells work a little faster. And it's not one of those dumb things which I deplore, which work just because you think they should, the, the placebo effect, or because you uh, once saw Shirley MacLaine give a lecture and you think you should you know, concentrate on frog noses or whatever the hell. Uh, no, the, the reasons are purely scientific and, and natural, and uh, your neighborhood doctor can tell you why vitamin C is good for you. There are other vitamins that are too. For that you exercise as well? Uh, compared to most 76-year-old men, yes. Compared to what my wife thinks I should do, not so much. <laughs> Steve, but I, I, I get in the pool most mornings mm -hmm. and work out for half an hour or so. Uh, I, I've never been much of a swimmer, so I get in the water up to my neck and uh, run around and splash and make a fool of myself. But it is great exercise. And you do it for half hour. That's great. What about the Steve Allen of 86 and 96? I'm so busy thinking of what I'm supposed to do this afternoon and tonight that uh, I never really give thought to what it's going to be like at 86 or 96. I have friends who are in that bracket. Uh, I was with Milton Berle just last night, and he's, I think, now 90, is it? Something like that. And uh, live as a firecracker last night. He, he, uh, again, you, you don't walk upstairs as quickly as you could uh, 30 years earlier, but he's still with us, he's still mentally active, and still funny. Some of our viewers may not be quite so successful in our careers or as healthful and healthy and vigorous as, say, you and I are. Have there ever been times where you were down or had some physical restrictions or limitations? And if so, how did you cope with them? Well, I'm not sure how to apply the word restrictions, but yes. Uh, did you get I, hurt? Or? Uh, yes, uh, to any such formulation of the question, the answer is, is yes. And I think that in, in that regard, I'm, I'm pretty normal. Uh, I've been rehearsing for death <laughs> all my life. Uh, it could be so construed. In fact, uh, shortly after I was born, my mother always used this phrase that I was, quote, given up for dead. I don't know why she always liked that, the sound of that, but she often used it in my childhood. I had no recollection of it because I was about a week or so old. But I had what was uh, 
double pneumonia, what was called double pneumonia, and still is. I had no idea until I was about 30 that all the word double means in that context is it affected both lungs. I thought it meant twice as bad as standard pneumonia. <laughs> and uh, they, the doctors did tell her that uh, we're afraid you're going to lose them, but for some reason or other, it, uh, I'm still around. Uh, I also had cancer surgery about 15 years ago at the same time and uh, for the same reason that Ronald Reagan did and uh, it was successful. And, uh, so I've how did you psychologically picture, I mean, do you ever get into a down depression? Oh, of course. Yeah, what time is it now? Okay. Yeah, I, I react to bad news, whether it's about Bosnia or my sister or anything else. Yeah. I don't even have a sister. It shows you how sympathetic <laughs> and sensitive I am. But uh, no, I, my, my reactions to bad stuff are the same as uh, everybody. In fact, I'm constantly energized because I am bugged at the uh, total lack of justice in the universe. The universe, Mother Nature, whatever phrase you want to use, knows nothing, if it knows anything, if, it, if indeed there's any consciousness there, which is a fair question. But uh, to use the term loosely, it knows nothing of justice. Uh, a way in which this question often occurs um, is, especially in the context of religious belief, is why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, we're all familiar with that question, but we don't seem to have noticed that nobody's ever answered it. It's a nice thing to talk about Sunday morning, but how about an answer, folks? And However, I'm being facetious, because there is none. The only section of scripture that deals with the question is the book of Job, and it has no answer either. It just creates this marvelous drama, a great dramatic story, saga, of this wonderfully virtuous man who despite his decency and his uh, heroism takes a hell of a beating from life, you know, and at the end you're still wondering how come, because he was so nice that we all could identify terrible people who we wish, it's not that we're sadistic, but if somebody has to suffer, how about them, instead of all the innocent two-year-olds who do suffer. Why do you suppose we worship youth so much? Well, it's physically uh, much better than old age, it's that, <laughs> that simple. Uh, but they didn't, in, according to what I read in Greek history or Roman. Oh, I see what you, you, know, I see what I mean, you mean. Today, we have such an yeah, idolization. You're, you're right. There is a special emphasis uh, on youth mm -hmm. now, sort of an idealization and idolization of uh, the early years. Uh, a marvelous question, as the politicians like to say, and it suddenly occurs to me for the first time in my life that the reasons for the situation are probably largely economic. Young people, even in America, never had discretionary spending money until, oh, just to pick an easy date, around 1950 or 60. In the past, you were lucky enough, uh, in my day, if you had seven cents for car fare, at least that's what it cost in Chicago in those days. But suddenly, uh, for a number of reasons, some obvious, America's uh, young folks had uh, extra spending money, whether they earned it or dad was guilty and gave it to them, whatever reason, they had it. And that seems nice in a way, and it is, better to have money than not. But unfortunately, when we're 12 and 13, we are really pretty dumb. Even those of us who later become smarter <laughs> are not too bright as a generality when we're that age. We are physically superior even then to 60-year-old people. We can run faster and see better and hear more acutely and do all those marvelous physical things. Nevertheless, society would never dream of letting us drive a car never dream of letting us get married, never dream of letting us vote, because you're still pretty much a dummy when you're that old. I'm not running for office, I'll tell the truth. So uh, when you take a dummy, an adorable dummy, I mean, I love my grandchildren, but and then you add you know, $28 in their back pocket, you're not going to get too much good news in the marketplace. They're going to eat more rotten food than they will eat good food. They're going to eat more tooth-rotting candy than nourishing fare. And uh, as regards the collapse of musical culture in our society, that is the primary reason for it. Once teenagers could buy their own stuff, they tended to vote for bubblegum, you know, beach blanket, bingo kind of musical nonsense written by people who only knew three or four chords. And they got to prefer that to what they got, to our generation got from George Gershwin and Cole Porter and uh, all the, the giants. That's a long answer to that question. So how are you going to try not to perpetuate this with your own children and grandchildren? You have 12 grandchildren? Yes. It's incredible. That's great. I, I don't believe look it. It <laughs> could be that incredible. How do you not perpetuate this same idolization? Well, my personal contribution has, to, has been to get old. <laughs> and say, look, it's not so terrible, right? Uh, you know, I, actually, I, I don't really do anything about the problem. I, I'm busy. <laughs> okay. 
I, I w I'll help those who have a more uh, philosophical approach, but I'm, I'm busy working. I do work seven days a week. I know. It's incredible. I would like to ask you something you once said. There are people who deserve the 20-minute ovation, but I'm not one of them. Could you briefly tell me what you meant by that? I can tell you what I meant by that. How briefly is a separate well. question. Uh, yeah, b because I can do, I don't know, eight, nine, fourteen, I never count of them, things that I earn money from and people smile at me about. Uh, I, I get more praise than I deserve. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not being modest. I'm no more modest than your Uncle Harry, nor can more conceited for that matter. I'm just being realistic. Uh, the reason I, I feel uncomfortable at being complimented about the songs and the comedy and the movies and all that is that it's all easy for me. There's no struggle. And artists are supposed to struggle. They're supposed to starve in a garret in Paris or whatever and be rebuffed and criticized and kicked out of offices and then finally, by God, they triumph. Nothing of that sort ever happened to me. I've been in show business since I was very young, went from one piece of good luck to another. And even as regards the specific activities, the writing of songs, for example, of which I've now written almost 7,000, there is no effort to that. I just sit down and play them, and that's all there is to it. There's no sweating and straining over what the next note will be or the next chord change. I just do it. Now, to turn the question over, are there then any people on earth who deserve credit? The answer is you betcha. Uh, in this context, I sometimes tell the story of an athletic hero of mine when I was about 14. He was the world's champion in the mile event. His name was Glenn Cunningham. And uh, the reason he deserves credit, and I don't, and a lot of other creative people don't, is that when he was about two and a half, his home burned down, and the little boy was badly burned, especially his feet and his legs. So let's call that chapter one of his life story. In chapter 37, he crosses the finish line in the Olympics or wherever, the fastest man on earth in the mile. Now, that's, that kind of a story brings tears to my eyes. And he deserves all the bows he wanted to take at the time. And, and that's why he does, and I don't. Absolutely. I do want to ask you this corny question. <laughs> I'll give you a corny answer. <laughs> How do you want to be remembered? To tell the truth, except by my grandchildren and a few close folks, it really doesn't mean a damn to well, me. Well, to your grandchildren. How would you like <laughs> to be remembered to your... Well, they will remember me chiefly as grandpa. As a matter of fact, uh, two of the grandkids are my son Bill's uh, children, uh, Bradley and Bobby. He has more than that, but I'll just refer to them at the moment because he brought them over to Las Vegas a couple of years back when I was performing there at the Sahara for a couple of weeks. And Bobby, who was about seven at the time, had never before seen me in action. He knew I was in show business. He saw me on television now and then, but uh, I was still just grandpa. So suddenly he sees me up on a stage with people screaming and cheering and my name in lights and all that. And this was a, not a shock to him, but a surprise. And I remember that night when I came upstairs, they were waiting for me up in our suite. And here's this cute little seven-year-old guy who has a great sense of humor. He looks at me, walk in the room, and he says, well, hello, star. <laughs> so uh, by them, I, I do hope to be remembered. Also, I hope to be remembered by them as the pest who is constantly urging them to virtue. I explained to them that the reason they are going through this process called education is obviously to learn how to count and read and all that, but more importantly, so that at the end of the process, they will be a gentleman. And I think they will remember that point. That's a good answer. I have a last question for you. Well, I got 12 answers left. <laughs> Do you remember what your reply was when someone once asked you, what do you think about sex on TV? <laughs> well, I did the line, uh, yeah, I'd be awfully careful of the antenna, which brings up a more important point than, than that joke itself. That's a very mod modestly, slightly uh, vulgar joke, and nobody ever objected to that kind of thing and then that slight degree of vulgarity. But today, oh, vulgarity yes. is dominant everywhere. Broadway, Vegas, Atlantic City, movies, television. TV, records, yeah. television, wherever you look. You can't get away from sleaze and ugliness and foul language. Now, if 57-year-old people want to do that, want to do that, and other 57-year-old people watch it, it's none of my business. I may approve or disapprove, but they don't need to hear from me. But the reason they do hear from me is because seven-year-old children are watching that garbage and it's warping their minds. We're depriving them of their innocence and sweetness and naivety. I agree, and it's, it's really something that I hope that you can use your influence to do more about. 
And I wish there were more Steve Allens. Uh, there are. Oh, Steve. <laughs> Meantime, I want to say goodbye <laughs> to this one and thank you so much. I really appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.